The point is something that I think is guilty of many uh, wrong interpretations, of many misunderstandings. And this is this binary schema on which we are educated and which we uh, theoretically and intellectually live, live for, for too long to doubt in it. Namely, that there is something like rationality or logic, exactness, and with it is connected to the formalism, the formal language, or the propositional language, the know that, you know, the factual knowledge, the conceptual, the intellectual, and so on. On the one side, it is habitually, standardly affiliated with scientific reasoning, and on the opposite side, we have like emotionality, intuition, imagination, expressiveness, non-propositional language, know that, this is the practical, the skilled language, the non-conceptual, the anti-intellectual, and so on. all of these attributes are connected with artistic creativity. And uh, we, we grew up with belief that they have virtually very little in common. Uh, worse than that, it is somehow assumed in order to be really scientific, that is to say rational, exact, logical, and so on, there should be no intrusion of this right side, right? Because it softens is in a way that we don't want to happen. And that is something that has been disturbing for me for, for very long. And I've been working off on it um, also as somebody coming from humanities and literature, trying to learn about the cognition, philosophy of mind, and so on and also wanting to, to work on uh, decomposing of this uh, firm, of firm and long-lasting uh, stereotype. How to do this? I, I'm making big steps in order to cover the larger field, uh, uh, possibly. So I'm advocating the so-called continuity thesis. The thesis is meant, we actually have two uh, Basic, basically two uh, options. Either to believe that with us, this human species, there came a, a break in the evolution, and what we present is something quite or qualitatively different from what happened uh, before, or that there is a continuity evolving from more simple um, organism to uh, more complex life like we are, and certainly I, uh, evolutionary, and not only in evolutionary sense, I'm advocating this continuity thesis, and I hope that will be more clear in what comes. The thesis is meant to overcome this gap that our bipolar conceptual system has imposed. It allows for the conclusion that there is no evolutionary gap between simple biological organisms and us, superior cultural beings, and also uh, no strict demarcation line between the so-called lower and the so-called higher cognitive processes, the unconscious and conscious, intuition, rationality, and so on, and so on. Um, but this is itself, I think, not, not enough. What is particularly important to me is to stress that the processes go both ways, not only the so-called lower uh, cognition that makes impact or is somehow closely connected to the higher, but it is also the other way around, and I call it bidirectionality. You call it, you say, B or bidirectionality? Bidirectionality, right. So only if we allow that higher mental processes can be acquired by the body, are we in the position to explain how the corporeal know-how evolves. Thus, both tendencies of the cognitive organism have to be recognized. The one in which conscious states tend to disappear in the non-conscious, but also inclination of the non-conscious to shape conscious experience. This disappearance is, is for instance, on the example of, say, a pianist, you know, who uh, actually should forget if, if the pianist would start suddenly to think about the movement of his fingers, he would be uh, paralyzed, actually. So there would be no, he could not come to the interpretation of, of the music if he were really consciousness involved 
in the manual action that he's performing. And so it's also with surgeons, or with, with, with pilot, with the cockpit, and many, many other uh, complex uh, actions that humans do that to a great extent are performed and done automatically. Um, well, the consequences of this continuity and bidirectionality thesis is that we finally uh, can uh, appreciate, fully appreciate, for instance, William James saying that the whole man counts, this is from one essay of Bergson, and also John Dewey's saying that mind is more than consciousness, because clearly our philosophies of mind are philosophies of conscious mind. Seldom is the non-conscious taken into, into account. And when I, last year, just a small episode, invited a, a big expert uh, in, in philosophy of consciousness, uh, David Chalmers, to take part in my conference on the non-conscious, he responded that he is actually interested in consciousness. So I was so disappointed because I thought, and responded, well, if you are interested in consciousness, you have to know, you have to be interested in how it is generated. And it means we have necessarily to deal with also the unconscious. It is not optional as it is now. You know, we can have this, but we don't have to. We can deal well theoretically if we just take into consideration this huge field of, of consciousness. I think this is not any longer the, the case. We cannot allow the, this uh, attitude uh, uh, also if we take in, into account a more recent um, empirical studies. But how to make this somehow convincing? It's all nice you know, to declare that we have now the continuity thesis and it, it goes by, both ways, it's uh, bidirectionality. And so let me try to, to illustrate it uh, in two ways. One through so these top-down cognitive processes, and uh, the other way is to illustrate it through the so-called bottom-up processes. Well, it is not so sophisticated as, as your train going in or out the, um, the tunnel, which also, but this basically serves, serves the, same, the same purpose. It is the astral illusion also used by Wittgenstein. Uh, okay, it is, you, you see, of course, it's both ways. Huh? It can be either duck or rabbit. Okay. You always read in the name. There is no way you can see it just as a graphical or optical pattern as it is now on the screen. Okay? There is no way you, to see it neutrally. That is the point of this top down. Okay? There's always interpreter with us. We necessarily interpret it. Whether you want or not. It is just duck or neb. It is not both. It cannot be both at the same time. So that means it cannot be just what it is, per se. So to say. Uh, and there are other interesting uh, optical illusions, but I think this just serves as representative of, of all that. But you can also connect it with, with what in a more sophisticated, nice way. Rodolfo presented in his uh, examples with the train and the lady, the lady rotating either one or the other way, depending on the way you perceive it. So you're always active, the, the content of perception, uh, most elementary thing is perception is nothing passive, it is not passive uptake. There is no way you can just open eyes and see the world as it is. Now you see it according to what you know about it. It is connected, some say, also with, with the expectations. You have to expect something in order to know it. Some say it is, it is fragmentary. It is always incomplete. Say a very good uh, colleagues and friend of my uh, Zahavi and Gallagher in one in one uh, uh, essay. But I I contrast it and say. Look, they're the fragmentary only on the, for instance, I'm seeing you, of course, now only torso. But I know that you are, fortunately, not just fragmented, a complete person. You see how just the front of it, not, not the back of it. Yeah. So to say it is incomplete only on the sensory level, but on the perceptual, experiential level, it is as complete as we need it. We fill in, so to say, the data and so on. 
this filling in is this component of, you know, top-down uh, process. And, okay, you can take any example that's uh, x-ray picture or cell phone and put it in front of a kid or an or a adult or an adult that is, uh, lives in our civilization and adults are belonging to those so-called primitive cultures that has no clue of what one or the other is, he or she won't be able to see anything. And so, if there is no neutral or naive seeing, there is also no neutral or naive hearing. It, seeing and hearing is always as. You always bring content into it. We are, as active subjects, always seeking for meanings. We cannot just be happy. We, we think there is sense in what, that's what we want to know as, as agents in order to orient ourselves better in the world. So, if the ear is not educated, you only hear sounds, not a Mozart or Wagner, but if you are exposed uh, to and familiarized with the classical music, you can never hear only sounds when a Mozart or Wagner is played. Because the cultural interpreter is always with us, we can never see or hear raw sensory data uninterpreted. And two nice quotes from C.I. Lewis, and very, uh, basically saying, uh, conveying the same idea from C.I. Lewis. We do not see patches of color, but trees and houses. We hear not the indescribable sound, but voices and violins. And Martin Heidegger famously observed, it requires a very artificial and complicated frame of mind to hear a fewer noise. What we first hear is never noise or complex of sounds, but the cracking wagon, the, motor, the motorcycle. We hear the column on the march, the north wind, the woodpecker tapping, the fire cracking, and you can add, and if you are afraid or scared, you hear so much in the footsteps of a uh, threatening being approaching you, and so on and so on. So there is no way to approach reality in some in virgin, uh, uh, neutral, or naive way, not even at the most elementary level, and not to talk about more, more complex um, examples of scientific observation or artistic uh, perception. Now, the other way around, in order to, for this uh, bidirectionality to be complete. Now, it's also, the bottom-up works also in our cognition. Two examples, briefly. Um, Susan Golden Meadow made a research at uh, Chicago University, has been late for, for, for years, already uh, studying gesture. And um, she examined students uh, while sitting on their, on their hands, that is, the hands were, in one case, were immobilized, they were not free to move, and in the other case, they were free to move, to gesture, you know, the motility, motility was uh, not inhibited in any way. Why uh, giving them uh, some mathematical exams and some creative tests to, to solve? Now, in all cases, the results were better when the hands were free, when they were free to gesture, free to move, free to free the energy, so to say, uh, which eventually also uh, uh, impact of the mental, of the higher mental functions. Another study, also quite recent, I think two years ago, at Stanford University, and they examined, they were, uh, the students were given uh, some standard creativity tests. They were given um, before walking and after walking. Now, walking was not long walk through woods with fresh air, uh, inspiring images and refreshing vistas and so on. No, it was boring walking within, within the closed room or corridors and so for 8 to 10 minutes. Now, again, in all repeated uh, examinations, uh, the results clearly showed that the re results are better after walk. So it is, as I said, walk itself 
It is this pure uh, mechanics of walking that make an impact, not the walking connected with the surroundings, with uh, contact with the nature, and so on. Okay. So here too, there is clearly um, connection between uh, the physical, the motility, and so-called higher or intellectual function. So there's something that even a contemporary cognitive science and philosophy of mind, mind had to recognize and had to respect, and they, now it is uh, pretty common now already to talk about the famous four E's, briefly about this. That, that is to say that cognition and mind are embodied, that is to say mind belongs to, 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 uh, to embodied being, it is important as we see. So just from the earlier, uh, uh, earlier example, you know um, how important it is this coupling to, uh, to physics. And this is, by the way, also this one of the huge elements that plays a role in uh, simulation. This is this element that cannot be simulated. Of that was Marvin Minsky, who passed away recently, was aware very early, at the very early ages at MIT, uh, uh, it was late 40s, early 50s, when he wrote, it won't be difficult to simulate um, intellectual functions and language-based uh, uh, processes, but it will be difficult to simulate how the child uh, unreflectively, you know, uh, builds its building blocks in playing. The simple physical, like that is what is difficult to simulate. Okay, then the mind is also uh, embedded, that it, it is connected to, to the surrounding, to the, it is immediate response to something that affords, the, the surrounding affords uh, an, an action. So, And it is inactive, there is a whole now. Uh, uh, let's say stream of inactivism within philosophy of mind that um, we are active beings we are active beings we are not just observers in the world we, are, we, we act in all possible ways starting from gesturing to changing our surrounding to building new tools to uh, writing sonatas to uh, making pictures and so on and so on. We are typically uh, active beings, as, as C.I. Lewis said, only because we are active beings can we have our world. If we could only observe it and be some kind of passive, you know, distance observer, there wouldn't be the world as we know it, it, it is. So we approach things talking about the perception in terms also of, of possible. The, the surrounding world is arena of possible action. You know, this I don't recognize so much according to its physical features or even color, but it's something I can grasp and use for this. And also, the finally, this is the newest um, aspect that mind is extended, uh, authored by Chalmers and, and Clark, their famous uh, article in 88. So they say, Whatever functions uh, fulfills the function of cognition, that may be you know, your, your notes, that can be your, your iPad, and so on and so on, is a way of extending, extending mind. And it is also pretty much now discussed in this past decade, the extended mind thesis uh, in all variations and so on. I, to my taste, it, it goes too, too far away, and now there, uh, thematizing how libraries function as extended mind and so on and so on, so that after all, I, I declared in my last lecture in Memphis, where it is the epitome of this, they said, well, we should, I, I, I dare to declare now back to body, back to body because we have forgotten the body, though we started with it. But then I come, I hope this has nothing to do with arrogance, but just maybe the, the idea, well, this is fine with these four E's, but there is something elementary missing, and this is the world. So I would say, and this is the, the draft, and uh, for long already states it as a draft to be elaborated, but, but with this title, a title, the fifth element, involvement. Indeed, it is only while the animals have also surroundings, only human beings have the world. That is, 
it comes with with symbols, the symbols that stay for something that is not immediately present to the senses. This is crucial for human mind to be able to conceive of things not present to the senses, to be to speculate also to make sense of the of fiction, of fictive, non not possible uh, in the real experience. Right? And this all somehow drives us for the rethinking about what the thought, what the thought is. And uh, I love this uh, Jesse Prince's uh, 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 saying from his gut reactions book, we can have thoughts without thinking. And something very similar came in your, in your slides in, in the movie uh, about unthought thoughts. Yeah. But coming now, let's say, from different sources, from different uh, ways of thinking, which is, I think, nice, that, that, correlates, that correlates and cross-fertilize somehow, uh, actually pointing toward the same thing. So, I hope this is not, it doesn't appear like, like here, not here, advertising, but just sharing and information. Somewhere along these lines is also my book, Knowing Without Thinking, whereby the title is much, much broader than actually the actual content of the book, which is uh, basically about the background. But I'm happy that a uh, famous American philosopher, Hubert Dreyfus, was ready and made the, um, wrote a nice introductory essay, essay to it. So, the past of deep thinking, of uh, which we are thinking here, uh, talking here, sorry, does need not necessarily lead through the terrain of thought as conceived by cognitivists and mainstream philosophers of mind. This deep thinking can be triggered as we have seen from trivial moves, from, from emotional uh, signal, from intuitive uh, you know, sign, from, from memory image, and so on. And so here, again, hopefully not, not taken as advertising, but just sharing of information, the book I'm certainly proud of, but it is uh, Jesse Prince in his introductory essay, which was Handy Manifesto, I wrote that this, this is a groundbreaking, whether it is or not, maybe you can judge yourself, but anyway, it is at least an attempt to bridge this gap by studying, I said, when I initiated this, I said, okay, we, have, we know so much, this embodied philosophy has uh, evolved and developed pretty much, but let's see how it works on one on one organ, on let's try to be more disciplined, more narrow, narrow down on, 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 on one organ like, like the pen. So this is this attempt to, to, to bridge the motility and uh, uh, higher mental functions, whereby some uh, number of articles is certainly demanding and uh, maybe only for, for philosophers. So, if I'm right in my claiming that mental processes are continuous and bidirectional, then there is no gap between the so-called higher and lower level cognition. The conclusion then follows that, for instance, gestures can facilitate speech, that walking can free thinking, that movement can boost creativity, and I go on with this, that memories can be generated by smell, taste, sound, or image, what I call Proustian methodology, of course, referring to à la recherche de la temps perdue. Perception can be colored by emotion, interpersonal relation can be initiated by, by touch here in Mediterranean culture. We are practicing this uh, a lot, have been practicing also these days. To some it is annoying, for us Mediterraneans it is not. It's somehow, and if two young couple first meets and is introducing, I think only after they touch for the first time, it changes the constellation. Okay? This, and there is one nice also. Okay contribution on interpersonal touch also in my book. So, reasoning can be generated by that feelings, laughter can refurbish our mental setting, moods can influence judgment, hunger can alter dispositions, as Jerome Bruno previously said, whether a piece of bread looks big or small depends whether you are hungry or not. It's not about measuring it in centimeters. So sort of conclusion, we are capacitated to do more than we can perform through logical, propositional, mental, mental processes. So in a way, whatever we do alters our mental constellation. As Eric Kandel, Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, nicely said, I love this, this sentence, 
Every conversation changes the brain. I, one could add every story refurnishes our mental spaces, and narration articulates experience. But the other way around is also true. Embodied experience impacts how we put things into, into words. And now the quote of Joseph Ledoux, whom obviously you also like to read, appreciate his, his ideas. Um, he said, if we are to understand how the mind through the brain makes us who we are, we need to consider the whole mind, not just the parts that subserve thinking. And the whole mind reminds us very much of, uh, of uh, um, William James. And by the way, Kandel in his uh, recent review on the most recent book of Ledoux on anxiety uh, says that, that Joseph Ledoux is William James of our times. And I'm very happy and proud to say that, that Joseph Ledoux is going to write an introductory uh, uh, essay to my new book, which is called Now Be the First, to know before consciousness in search of the fundamentals of mind to, pe to appear in, in, in the academic. He said, minds feel as well as think, and feelings involve more than thinking. So, I'd like to see that there is, it is difficult now to talk about the purity of any sense uh, in, in, this, in this context. There is no pure consciousness, just as there is no virgin unconscious. They both cross-fertilize through permanent exchange. And I think you would, Carlos, agree, because we talk about intuition just in this sense. And Ramachandran, uh, from his Phantoms in the Brain, says, There is in fact another being inside you that goes about his or her business without your knowledge of or awareness. I'm not fond of this rhetoric of being another. Whenever we recognize something that is not in accord with our standards view, then we say, you see, there is something strange in us. Rather than accepting this and, and uh, acknowledging well, eventually this is part, natural part of us. Why is that some alien in us? Whenever it is not in accord with our standard views, then there is this alien. Even the brain is alien to us, something we have to endure, but we rather not do that when we talk about um, high cognition. Okay. In both uh, phil phylogeny and ontogeny, actions of the unconscious mind precede the arrival of the conscious mind. Okay. Precede actions, precede reflection. All experience and uh, from Popper and Eccles, the self and his brain, all experiences already interpreted by the nervous system a hundredfold or a thousandfold before it becomes conscious experience. Clearly, consciousness is a late product in this mental processing. If we would depend on consciousness only, we would basically always be late. So we have to predict things. And now this is another aspect. A lovely, a lovely uh, quote uh, from Joseph Ledoux. Let me read and enjoy every, every word. Uh, he, he poses the rhetoric question, uh, what are all these unconscious processes and answers? Actually, they include almost everything the brain does, from standard body maintenance, like regulating uh, heart rate, breathing rhythm, stomach contraction and posture, to controlling many aspects of seeing, smelling, behaving, feeling, speaking, thinking, evaluating, judging, believing, and imagining." Unquote. I think it needs no comment, but also I don't have time to comment. Um, well, then with this knowledge that I presented, I admit, in a very sketchy, sketchy way, anyway, I think, hope it is still is sufficient to now approach um, our perception on science and art and, 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 and test these uh, widespread and, and so vital stereotypes that these are two incommensurable rivals. Um, because even the most recent empirical investigations do not support this type of stereotype, you know, that I criticized at the very beginning. So, if that is so, then we do not deal with two different or exclusive types of creativity, but just with two different types of symbolic languages in which they are spelled out. So we are blinded by the difference in language. Of course, there are huge differences between the pictorial language 
of the, 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 the dramatic language, or theatrical language, or language of literature, and here language of theorems uh, and, 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 and so on. But it still does not mean to conclude that due to these differences in, in, in the kind of symbolism in which they are expressed, uh, necessarily leads to the conclusion that the completely different creative process, or that there are two different minds standing behind those. Thus, lovely a quote from Leo Szilard, who says, the creative scientist has much in common with the artist and the poet. Logical thinking and an analytical ability are necessary attributes to a scientist, but they are far from sufficient for creative, for creative work. Those insights in science that have led to a breakthrough were, were not logically derived from pre-existing knowledge. The creative process on which the process, uh, progress of science is based operates on the level of the subconscious. So this brings me, it brings me to the topic of aesthetics of science, which is personally connected with some bitter experience because I started this um, and wrote an, an article many years ago, 20 or so, as a young assistant, I was rejected. It was, it, was, it, was, it was rejected, always on some grounds. I'm I'm, I cannot now elaborate. But I was a persistent, and then finally, when I was not a small assistant, but invited to, to, to provide a talk at the uh, Faculty of Letters in uh, 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 Japan, in, in Tokyo, Tokyo University, then I picked up this again, and they said that it was toward the aesthetics of science. And they loved it, and it was published in Japanese, and then in English, and then in Slovene, not in Croatian. But just a small, it, it's, the personal episode is not important, but important is, you know, how people react, even the small attempt to bring something, something new that is not in accord. It, this is not the revolution. I'm not uh, the genius who is bringing something new. But, but a small attempt to, to, to open new vistas on, and it is still, it is still problematic. Yes. But beauty of which was so nicely and spontaneously uh, uh, talk uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Schlau's uh, presentation. Just quote uh, briefly, authority, I don't have to comment this. Poincaré says, it's a real aesthetic feeling that all mathematicians recognize, and this is truly sensibility. The useful combinations are precisely the most beautiful. And if nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing, and life would not be worth living. Very similar to Hermann Weil. Also, my work always tried to unite the true with the beautiful, but when I had to choose the one or the other, I usually choose the beautiful. And Dirac, similarly, it is more important, even so radical, to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment, and so on. Does this make science less objective through all this? Has this softened the science and, it, and its uh, uh, constitutive, you know, exactness and so on? No, I would think. It can only make it more uh, appear to us more human. And Heinz Science is a human endeavor, also without within the limitations. Also, when we humble uh, admit, it is uh, always always limited. And because the universe makes sense to us <coughs> only in as much we can trans transcribe it into the cognitive terms that we have authored, that, that it bear always this human stamp. The universe is not the object out there. This is only to recognize through the matrices of our cognitive, uh, you know, uh, network, then let's call it universe. Thank you.